Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming out this evening, family day or night or whatever. I uh, never realized I was so convincing that I could go out into the uh, uh, the world and convince people of uh, joining Nature Regina. I don't know if I selected the people to know that uh, that's what I was there for or not, but I never was as successful as the uh, males, uh, the, the Hungarian partridge males that have females chasing me all over the place. I'll have to see uh, what the, uh, the, the uh, approach is of, uh, of these uh, Hungarian partridge. We've actually seen that happening in our yard as well. So I'm here to talk about uh, about my book, Conserving the Legacy. Uh, it uh, was uh, 20 some years in uh, production. And when I left the uh, uh, provincial government, I thought, well, I, I have experienced a whole lot of interesting things and I should maybe write up a few notes and I kept writing and I kept writing and I kept writing and I ended up with this long manuscript and I went to see uh, uh, folks over at uh, Nature Saskatchewan and I said, uh, you know, I got this manuscript, would you be interested in publishing a book? And they said, sure, we'll publish your book. So what you see is what you got. And uh, uh, so tonight I thought I'd just give you a, a quick rundown of what it's all about. I, it's uh, kind of chock full of uh, details and uh, information about things that happened over the 20th century uh, from uh, 1905 to 2005, essentially. But before that all started, uh, we uh, should all probably realize that uh, by 2000 or 1905, there was very few uh, wild animals patrolling the prairies, and parklands in Saskatchewan. It was uh, pretty much a wasteland as far as wildlife was concerned. Indiscriminate hunting of the bison that wiped out the, 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 all the buffalo and the other large animals, and a lot of the large birds as well, swans and large Canada geese were almost extinct. So when the uh, people who were uh, assigned the responsibility to manage the, the wildlife, they called it game, uh, they uh, had very little to work with. And so the first thing they did was to concentrate on reducing all this, this uh, rampant killing. So they closed hunting seasons, or if they had a hunting season, it was very limited and short and small bag limits and so on. The other approach was to try and enhance the uh, recruitment of wild animals. And the uh, uh, th only thing they could think of was to uh, actually move animals around. So if there was... Uh, uh, a shortage of, say, beavers in the uh, commercial forest, uh, they'd get beavers from somewhere else and, and translocate them and stock them in northern Saskatchewan. Now, that sounds simple enough, except the way they did it in those days, they thought they were being really smart because uh, the uh, airplane had just kind of come into use a little bit, and they would... Uh, uh, live traps some beavers sort of in southern Saskatchewan where there was still quite a few and uh, load them onto a bush plane, fly them up into a, a suitable lake up in the uh, forest and gently release them off the pontoons of the plane. The pilots always like to say that the beavers helped them fly the planes, but I don't think that would have worked. But the uh, early uh, wildlife managers, they really had a, an animal focus. So there was no understanding of habitat relationships. 
uh, for like the whole life cycle of a, of a particular animal. So uh, each each specific animal, people were were interested in in uh, enhancing that population and so on. But one thing that was done back in the early days, and uh, I think it uh, was first uh, the convention first took place in 1916 and 17, uh, the uh, Migratory Bird Convention, and then there was an act passed in Canada and uh, the United States and eventually Mexico. That was a major, major uh, step forward in managing the migratory birds that uh, traveled back and forth every year. Uh, before that, it was believed that there was so many birds that uh, you never had to worry about them. But I guess they got scarce enough, they felt they had to do something. And they really accomplished quite a bit by that because our wildlife uh, hunting seasons for, um, for ducks and geese are still based on agreements between the uh, uh, Canadian government, the provinces and the uh, USA. Uh, with Mexico coming on later on. Uh, and the, the main approach was to restrict hunting seasons. Uh, there were a few game preserves created uh, that used to be uh, forest reserves or were still forest reserves. And they, they just um, strengthened the legislation to make them wildlife reserves as well. So there was a little bit of habitat created, and saved, and the uh, uh, province uh, got a hold of some uh, pheasants and uh, started a, a pheasant rearing facility south of uh, Saskatoon, uh, just uh, by Beaver Creek there. And that pheasant uh, farm raised pheasants for uh, well up into the 19... Uh, 70s, I think it was. And uh, uh, one of my first jobs when I came here as a, a biologist was, or a summer student, actually, was to uh, load a bunch of uh, baby pheasants in, into chicken, those chicken crates that you can buy baby chicks in and take them off to different locations around the province. So you be driving, it would be hot. You'd be driving down a stuff road, and dust just billowing in through the windows of the station wagon. <laughs> and you go find a nice spot there that uh, looked like there'd be lots of place for the pheasants to to breed and uh, multiply, and you'd take them off the uh, back of the uh, car and. And, em and empty them out onto the side of the road, and they'd go trundling off into the ditch. But I, I lost faith in that approach. When I had a chance, I stopped it. <laughs> because when you, if you turned around at the end of the, of the road and came back, all those pheasants, uh, little guys that you had released, were still standing on the road like this. And they, <laughs> They had no sense of uh, self-preservation whatsoever. I never did actually see a coyote in in the marsh or slough near nearby uh, licking his chops, but I'm sure they were there. So the uh, stocking and restocking and the restrictions of hunting was the main thrust for perhaps the first 50 years of that uh, 20th century. Uh, one other thing that uh, they did, the conservation managers did do was uh, some public relations and uh, uh, education. The uh, early game branch was actually a branch of uh, the Department of Agriculture. And the Department of Agriculture was trying to help farmers learn more about how to say it, how to farm successfully. And they had these, uh, better farming trains uh, uh, where they had a, a number of um, cars in a passenger train outfitted to act as a, as a traveling museum. 
And the wildlife people, they um, thought, well, that'd be a good way of passing on some information to the public about wildlife. So they used that as a, uh, a public uh, education program. But come the end of the uh, first uh, half uh, century, 1950s, uh, a lot of the work I think was actually done by non-government organizations like Nature Saskatchewan and you know, local chapters uh, here and there around the province. They, uh, the uh, Saskatchewan Wildlife uh, Federation, which came from the all the fish and game leagues that were created, and the uh, people at Ducks Unlimited that uh, were working diligently on all the wetlands to try and enhance the, the wetland, wetland uh, habitat uh, that uh, had um, been largely um, destroyed by the dirty uh, 30s. Well, when the 1950s rolled around, the powers that be in Regina decided, and Ottawa, decided they needed a little bit of uh, technical expertise. So they started hiring uh, professional biologists and they brought a more scientific approach to wildlife management and wildlife conservation. And so there was a whole lot of, uh, of wildlife research programs got going. And uh, uh, when I first came out, my first responsibility was to do a, a study, a multi-year study on sharp-tailed grouse, but there was studies on all the major game mammals and uh, uh, large Canada geese that nested on the prairies here. So uh, for 20, 25 years there, there was a tremendous proliferation of information about population dynamics and, uh, and habitats for game species. They discovered that uh, it was the one thing to know that uh, moose required a certain kind of habitat or deer required a slightly different kind of habitat or ducks required a different habitat again. But where was all this habitat? They had no idea. So, and this was a common problem across Canada. The uh, Canadian Wildlife Service or it started out as the Dominion Wildlife Service. They took it upon themselves to uh, uh, start uh, what, uh, under the uh, auspices of the, uh, um, oh no, what was it called? It was a major uh, program uh, all across Canada that uh, was uh, ARDA, it was called, Better Agriculture. And uh, it, it uh, was, an attempt to get a good idea of where the best farmland was, and it also included where the best wetlands and, and upland habitat for wildlife was. So the uh, ARDA program uh, created the uh, Canada Land Inventory, which was uh, uh, a, a, a mapping process carried out by the uh, the Canadian government. And uh, in Saskatchewan, we decided we needed a little more specific information about Saskatchewan uh, uh, wildlife. So uh, we did a terrestrial, it was called the Terrestrial Wildlife Habitat uh, Inventory. <laughs> Ducks Unlimited people, they did a similar kind of a, a survey and an inventory of wetlands. And these all, were used eventually to develop uh, uh, different uh, management plans, which were uh, uh, used uh, uh, for doing uh, uh, further wildlife surveys and uh, managing forests and uh, managing land management anywhere where government had an influence. Uh, uh, eventually and ultimately, the provincial database was used to to uh, set up the uh, information for the Habitat Wildlife Habitat Protection Act, 
And for any of you who came to the uh, program a couple months ago, uh, commemorating uh, Lawrence Scott and his uh, the book about him, uh, he was instrumental in getting this uh, Wildlife Habitat Protection Act passed. And that whole act was based on a whole bunch of maps that a whole bunch of summer students spent hours and hours and hours coloring up in the uh, back rooms of the of provincial uh, administration building. <laughs> I still remember all these all these young people coloring maps. Uh, I don't know whether when we recruited those kids, whether we asked them if they could color between lines or not. <laughs> But that was their major uh, job for a long time. So the, uh, the Wildlife Habitat Protection Act was uh, brought into force. The uh, Canadian government uh, also developed a wildlife policy of Canada, uh, which was uh, emulated by the provinces. So then, uh, uh, and also the uh, some of the non-government organizations. World Wildlife Fund, uh, uh, national ENGO, they uh, came up with the idea of the uh, uh, of a conservation action plan for uh, for Canada, and uh, so that sort of set the pace and tone for the different provinces to develop uh, similar kinds of action plans. With catch on uh, um, the agricultural people and the wildlife people, quite often were at odds, but in this case, they got together and they created the Prairie Conservation Action Plan. And it's interesting that uh, it wasn't uh, the Wildlife Branch or uh, Wildlife Federation or Nature uh, Regina or any any conservation organization that took possession of that, it was the ranchers. And the ranchers at that time, at that same time, were um, quite concerned about the loss of uh, native prairie. So they undertook to implement the various uh, actions of the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan. About the same time, the federal government uh, uh, standing committee, Senate standing committee on land use, uh, the Sparrow committee, it was called. Herb Sparrow was a um, Saskatchewan uh, senator in Ottawa, and he headed up a study that ended up uh, uh, producing a book called Soils at Risk. In that book, they identified across Canada that what the uh, condition of soils was. Now, soils, uh, when I was in school and just about everybody else I ever ran into who had a biological bent were not interested in soils. But it turns out soils were the basis for just about everything else that happens that was on the landscape. And uh, the uh, Herb Sparrow's report uh, uh, called so Soils at Risk uh, determined what the big the problems were. And in Saskatchewan and the drier parts of the prairies, the big problem was summer following. And it was after that that some of you may have noticed, those who have spent much time out in the landscape, that uh, um, about uh, 30, 35 years ago, they stopped summer following. Uh, there used to be one out of three years that were spent summer fall, uh, a, a field would be summer fall. Sometimes it was every second year. And uh, there was a reason for this. The farmers believed that that would conserve uh, moisture for uh, forthcoming crops. But the Sparrow uh, report pointed out that by leaving the soil black and letting the wind blow over it and the rain pour down on it, it was just eroding all the, the goodness out of the soil. So they stopped almost 
well, within a decade, with the assistance of uh, Ducks Unlimited, doing a lot of the extension work and the agricultural people approaching the farmers and they stopped summer following. That was really a good thing for most wildlife species. Anything that nests on the ground or the small mammals that live in the low vegetation, they now weren't exposed to part of the summer or part of the year rather and uh, by summer following. So it really enhanced the nesting uh, habitat and the uh, reproductive success of uh, a lot of the migratory birds, uh, a lot of the ducks and the uh, upland uh, um, shorebirds and what have you. And uh, so that was a major step forward. And um, just to kind of wind the, the uh, talk up, towards the end of the uh, uh, 20th century, or around the 19, from the 1980s on to the turn of the century, there was a, an increasing concern about the loss of biological diversity and the increase in numbers of, uh, of uh, wildlife species that were becoming a risk of extinction. So there's been a tremendous amount of work put towards species at, at risk over the last, uh, um, well, it's going back 40 years or so now, but uh, that concern still continues. Uh, you may, some of you may have heard on the news yesterday that the uh, United Nations is still there, uh, um, um, committees that are working on land use and so on are becoming increasingly concerned with the loss of biodiversity of uh, the different species of uh, plants and animals in Canada. So the uh, federal government, they undertook a, a, pro a project to, or a um, program to uh, protect species at risk. And they brought, uh, uh, they passed a, uh, an act called the Species at Risk Act or SARA. And that has been uh, widely quoted and widely used over the last few decades as well. So looking ahead, it'd be nice to say that we've got all this business of uh, wildlife conservation corralled and we just have to continue doing what we've been doing. But that's really not the case when we're looking at uh, climate change in the face and with it, uh, the significant and rapid loss of biological diversity on the landscape. So in the last uh, uh, 25 years, since the turn of the century, uh, there's been uh, uh, quite a few uh, attempts made to address this whole business of climate change and loss of biodiversity, but that's not in the book. <laughs> that's for another author to uh, research out and uh, perhaps we'll get another book before too long. So I'll uh, stop there. Are you gonna leave it open for questions? Yes. All right. We would like some questions from the audience. Does anyone have any questions for Wayne? Okay, Dale. And we're, we'll repeat your question so that the audience at home can hear it. And uh, Wayne's question more related to your first project, uh, you mentioned studying shark tail grows, but as you may not know, but I expect we looked at shark tail grows movement then. Well, it was mentioned in the shark tail growth. Dale, Dale did. And I noted that in the city other records, there's always shark tail growth in the summertime. So how far do shark tail growth move? I always wonder where these funds we see in the winter come from. Do you have any idea how from your studies how uh, far you know, what kind of seasonal movements they might be here in the province? Uh, you were asking, Dale, uh, how far shark tail grouse move 
during different times of the year. And when I was doing my uh, research study at Aspeth, just west of Saskatoon, there was uh, a good mix of uh, tree cover, shrub cover, and prairie, as well as cultivated land. So they had a pretty complete sort of uh, palette there, if you want to put it that way. But there are some areas that, uh, and I suspect around Regina may be one of those areas, where they have to move from uh, where maybe they have uh, nested or where they've gone in the fall uh, to uh, build up their fat reserves, because they do that. They, they'll go and you'll see them feeding out on the uh, uh, colored fields. Like. And uh, then in the winter, they, they go into a heavier cover. In the, in the summertime, their nesting habitat in some parts of the province is a different place, a different area than uh, their um, spring and fall and uh, winter habitat is. But I found that uh, the, uh, well, we all know uh, sharp tailed grouse uh, uh, mate on uh, uh, leks or dancing grounds. And they would travel about six miles uh, from the dancing ground to uh, and go back and forth that way. They are, they're actually quite strong flyers. And there used to be, <clears throat> and I don't know if this still happens or not, <clears throat> but there used to be uh, uh, stories <clears throat> about uh, sharp tails moving vast different uh, distances over in the Great Sand Hills area. There used to be just uh, very high populations of sharp tailed grouse there back in the 60s. And then they seemed to disappear uh, to a large extent. Why, I don't have any idea. But they used to, they used to see large flocks of them moving uh, in that area for some reason. But I suspect it's all a function of food availability and, and cover. Any other questions? <clears throat> I'll clear my throat while you're thinking. <clears throat> yes. No, I haven't. I see. And it's called wings over wings over water. At the at IMAX. At with the all, IMAX. Yes. Yes. The the uh, information is that the uh, movie, uh, forty five minute uh, movie, uh, wings over water. Uh, it's a documentary film. It's just an excellent film. Oh yeah, it's on until sometime in April. Though. <laughs> Any other questions? I I will have some questions if others don't, but I'm just put okay. So I'm afraid I have a whole list of, <laughs> of questions. Um and you may not be able to to answer this, but um when you go onto the the internet and look at the species at risk for Saskatchewan, only a short list comes up. But if you go to the federal page, there's a much longer list. I've never understood that. Can, can you explain what's happening there, if you know? I'm afraid I don't really know, but uh, 
I do know that um, when I was still working in the field, that there were uh, a large uh, percentage of the species at risk nationally actually occurred here in Saskatchewan and, and in the uh, southern part of Saskatchewan. And I think it was because we had uh, a large percentage of the native prairie left in Canada. And most of these species are uh, prairie dwelling species. And uh, so you had things like burying owls and chestnut collared long spurs. They don't really occur much anywhere else. Um, and the um, black footed ferret and the, the swift foxes, all those species, they really only occur here. So I don't know why, I, I think there's been a lot of other species found that were at risk in Canada since that time. Mm -hmm. But the uh, ones that are at risk here, Dale, you can correct me maybe if I'm wrong. I think they're still basically the same ones that have been, yeah. I, I think the different thing that's noted is, uh, I think the answer was actually in, in uh, what's it called? Say anyway, the Warren Scott book that we heard about here in November. Um, when Warren was minister, there were some endangered species today. I can't remember if you were part of that or not at the time when you heard about the last thing was put into the... Uh, in, into the Wildlife Act. And the initial list of species was supposed to follow shortly after that. We were all interested in doing anything much for the nature species, in my view, anyway. And, and they uh, have never added to that list. Right. So, what you see when you look at the provincial one is initial list when Lawrence Scott was minister, which is 25 years ago. The federal government has an ongoing process to many of the data from these wildlife that are evaluating and adding. Mm -hmm. They all used to be the endangered species expert for the, the uh, department for the wildlife branch. And I'm sure he uh, sees uh, the uh, Kosiewicz reports and the status reports in his sleep <laughs> because he used to have to <laughs> produce these by, uh, by the dozens. <laughs> But what Dale said confirmed what I said, that the Saskatchewan list has not been updated for 20 to 25 years, though I think they may or may not make reference to the federal list. So thank you, Dale. Um, the, the other question I had was about PCAP, because I think I went to one of the very first workshops they had, and I remember that because I was sort of not a rancher, not with government, I had to get at first somehow special permission to attend. And now I would have to say that is one of the most successful workshops out there for the environment. If you ever have a chance to go, it's fantastic. And what I really like about it um, is that people from different um, uh, places in life talk to each other. So you get ranchers and oil people and environmentalists and, and school teachers. They're all talking to each other at those meetings. So uh, if you ever have a chance to go, I would highly recommend them. And so you had something to do with that, is that right? Uh, not directly, no. Okay. I was just a reporter. In this case, <laughs> but I, I think we make a good point, Ingrid, that uh, through the years of uh, efforts to uh, conserve wildlife in Canada and in the province, you get a lot better results if you inv involve all the so-called stakeholders, because as a compatriot of mine used to say, nobody's got a monopoly on good ideas. And we need all the good ideas we can get. And I think that will be the end of my uh, my questions. But I, 